G'day everyone, this is Terry again from Koala Crafts and um, another reading from Gone with the Wind. While in the background I'm doing, um, I'm painting a diamond, uh, sorry, a, a Treasure Studios art diamond painting. Um, as you're aware, I am an affiliate with Treasure Studios Art. Um, just down the bottom in the description, you will find um, the link. And if you just use Koala15 in the um, discount code, you can receive 15% discount off your orders. So here we go. As I think I said this is number eight. And we'll start from now. Gerald's face had brightened as if by magic at her entrance. Is the brat baptised, he questioned. Yes, and dead poor thing, said Ellen. I feared Emmy would die too, but I think she will live. The girl's faces turned to her startled and questioning, and Gerald wagged his head philosophically. Well, tis better so that the brat is dead, no doubt. Poor father, it's late. We had better have prayers now, interrupted Ellen so smoothly that if Scarlet had not known her mother well, the interruption would have passed unnoticed. It would be interesting to know who the father of, of um, Emmy Slattery's baby, but Scarlet knew she would never learn the truth from her, of the matter if she waited to hear it from her mother. Scarlet su suspected Jonas Wilkerson, for she had frequently seen him walking down the road with Emmy, Emmy at nightfall. Jonas was a Yankee and a bachelor, and the fact that he was an overseer forever barred him from any contact with the county's social life. There was no family of any standing into which he could marry, no people with whom he could associate except the Slatteries, and Riff Raff liked them. As he was Um, where, as he was several cuts above the Slatteries in education, it was only natural that he should not want to marry Emmy, no matter how often he might walk with her in the twilight. Scarlet sighed, for her curiosity was sharp. Things were always happening under her mother's eyes, which she noticed no more than if they had not happened at all. Ellen ignored all things contrary to her ideas of propriety, and tried to teach Scarlet to do the same, but with poor success. Ellen had stepped to the mantel to take her rosary beads from a small inlaid casket in which they always reposed when Mammy spoke up with firmness. Miss Ellen, you give each some supper before you does any praying. Thank you, Mammy, but I'm not hungry. I'll go fix your supper myself and you will eat it, said Mammy, her brow furrowed with an indic indignation that she, that she started down the hall for the kitchen. Poke, she called, tell Cookie to stir up some, some of that fire, Miss Ellen home. As the board shuddered under her weight, she had been muttering in the front hall grew louder and louder coming clearly to the ears of the family in the dining room ah has said time and again it don't do no good doing nothing for white trash days a selfishest most ungrateful parcel of no counts living and miss ellen got no business wearing herself out waiting on folk that did not even worth shooting. They'd have blacks to wait on them and ah uh, has said. I have trouble with, with the way Mammy speaks. I'm sorry about that. Her voice trailed off as she went down the long open passageway covered only by a roof that led into the kitchen. Mammy had her own method of letting her owners know exactly where she stood on all matters. 
She knew it was beneath the dignity of quality white folks to pay it the slightest attention to what a black person said, but she was just grumbling to herself. She knew that to uphold this dignity, they must ignore what she said. Even if she stood in the next room and almost shouted, it protected her from reproof and it left no doubt to anyone's mind as to her exact views on any subject. Pork entered the room bearing a plate silver and a napkin. He was followed closely by Jack, a black little boy of 10 hastily buttoning his white linen jacket with one hand and bearing in the other a fly swisher made of thin strips of newspaper tied to a to a reed longer than he was. Ellen had a beautiful peacock feather fly brusher, but it was used only on very special occasions and then only after domestic struggle due to the obstinate conviction of pork, cookie and mammy that peacock feathers were bad luck. Ellen sat down in the chair which Gerald pulled out for her and four voices attacked her. Mother, the lace is loose on my new ball dress and I want to wear it tomorrow night at Twelve Oaks. Won't you please fix it? Mother, Scarlett's new dress is prettier than mine and it, I look like a fright in pink. Why can't she wear my pink and let me wear her green? She looks all right in pink. Mother, can I stay up for the ball tomorrow night? I'm 13 now. Mrs O'Hara, would you believe it? Hush you girls! Before I take me crop to you, Cade Calvert was in Atlanta this morning and he says, will you be quiet and let me be hearing me own voice? And he says it's all upset they are. They're all talking nothing but war. Military drilling, troops forming. And he says the news from Charleston is that they will be putting up with no more Yankee insults. Ellen's tired mouth smiled into the chomet and as she addressed herself first to her husband as a wife should. If the nice people of Charleston feel that way, I'm sure we will all feel the same way soon, she said. For she had a deeply rooted belief that expecting only Savannah, most of the gentle blood of the whole continent, could be found in that small seaport city, a belief shared largely by Charlestonians. No, Karen, next year, dear. Then you can stay up for balls and wear grown-up dresses. And what a good time my little pink cheeks will have. Don't pout, dear. You can go to the barbecue, remember that, and stay up through supper. But no balls until you're 14. Give me your gown, Scarlet. I'll whip the waist up, lace up for you after prayers. Sue Ellen, I do not like your tone, dear. Your pink gown is lovely and suitable to your complexion. Scarlet's is, Scarlet's is to hers. But you may wear my garnet necklace tomorrow night. Sue Ellen, behind her mother's back, wrinkled her nose triumphantly at Scarlet, who had been planning to beg the necklace for herself. Scarlet put out her tongue at her sister. Sue Ellen was an annoying sister with her whining and selfishness and had not it been for Ellen's restraining hand, Scarlet would frequently have boxed her ears. Now, Mr O'Hara, tell me more about what Mr Colbert said about Charleston, said Ellen. Scarlet knew her mother cared nothing at all about war and politics and thought them masculine matters about which no lady could intelligibly concern herself. But it gave Gerald, Gerald pleasure to air his views and Ellen was unfailingly thoughtful of her husband's pleasure. While Gerald launched forth on his news, Mammy set the plates before her mistress. 
golden top biscuits, breast of fried chicken and a yellow yam open on ste and steaming with melted butter dripping from it. Mammy pinched small Jack and he hastened to his to his business of slowly swishing the paper ribbons back and forth behind Ellen. Mammy stood beside the table watching every forkful that travelled from the plate to mouth as though she intended to force the food down Ellen's throat should she see signs of flagging. Ellen ate diligent, diligently but Scarlet could see that she was too tired to know what she was eating. Only Mammy's impeccable face forced her to it. When the dish was empty and Gerald only midway in his remarks on the thievishness of Yankees who wanted to free blacks and yet offend, offered no penny to pay for their freedom, Ellen rose. We'll be having prayers, he questioned reluctantly. Yes, it is so late. Why, it is actually 10 o'clock. As the clock with coughing and tiny thumps marked the hour, Corinne should have been asleep long ago. The lamp, please, pork, and my prayer book, Mammy. Prompted by Mammy's hoarse whisper, Jack set to his fly brush in the corner and removed the dishes while Mammy fumbled in the sideboard drawer for Ellen's worn prayer book. Pork, tiptoeing, tip reached the ring. Uh, reached the ring in the chain and, and drew the lamp slowly down until the tabletop was brightly bathed in light and the ceiling receded into shadows. Ellen arranged her skirts and sank to the floor on her knees. Laying the open prayer book on the table before her and clasping her hands upon it, Gerald, ne Gerald knelt beside her and Scarlet and Sue Ellen took their accustomed places on the opposite side of the table, folding their voluptuous petticoats in pads under their knees so they would ache less from the contact with the hard floor. Corrine, who was small for her age, could not kneel comfortably at the table, so she knelt facing a chair, her elbows on the seat. She liked this position for she seldom failed to go to sleep during prayers. And in this posture, it escaped her mother's notice. The house servants shuffled and rustled in the hall to kneel by the doorway. Mammy groaning aloud as she sank down. Pork straight as a ramrod. Rosa and Tina, the maids, graceful in their spreading bright calicos. Cookie gaunt and yellow beneath her snowy head rag. And Jack stupid with sleep as far away from Mammy's pinching fingers as possible. Their dark eyes gleamed expectantly for their praying with their white folks was one of the events of the day. The old and colourful phrases and, and of the litany with its oriental imaging meant little to them, but it satisfied something in their hearts and they always swayed when they chanted the responses, Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Ellen closed her eyes and began praying, her voice raising and falling, lulling and soothing, heads bowed in the circle of yellow light as Ellen thanked God for the health and happiness of her home, her family and her black people. When she finished her prayers for those beneath the roof of Tara, her father, mother, sisters, three dead babies and all the poor souls in purgatory. She clasped, clasped her white beads between her long fingers and began the rosary. Like the rushing of a wind, of a soft wind, the responses from black throats and white throats rolled back. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Despite her heartache and the pain of unshed tears, a deep sense of quiet and peace fell upon Scarlet, as it, as it always did at this hour. Some of the disappointment of the day and the, 
and the dread of the morrow departed from her, leaving a feeling of hope. It was not the lifting up of her heart to God that brought this balm, for religion went no more than lip deep with her. It was the sight of her mother's serene face upturned to the throne of God and his saints and angels praying for blessings for those whom she loved. When Ellen intervened, intervened with heaven, Scarlet felt certain that heaven heard. Ellen finished and Gerald, who could never find his beads at prayer time, began furtively counting his decade on his fingers. As his voice strained on, Scarlet's thoughts strayed in spite of herself. She knew she, sh she should be examining her conscience. Ellen had taught her that at the end of each day, it was her duty to examine her conscience thoroughly, to admit her numerous faults and pray to God for forgiveness and strength, never to repeat them. But Scarlet was examining her heart. She dropped her head upon her folded hand so that her mother could not see her face and her thought went sadly back to Ashley. How could he be planning to marry Melanie when he really loved her, Scarlet? And when he knew how much she loved him, how could he deliberately break her heart? Then suddenly an idea shining and new flashed like a comet through her brain. Why, Ashley hasn't had an idea that I'm in love with him. She almost gasped aloud in the shock of its unexpectedness. Her mind stood still as if paralysed for a long breathless instant and then raced forward. How could he know? I've never acted so prissy and ladylike and touch me not around him. He probably thinks I don't care a thing about him except as a friend. Yes, that's why he's never spoken. He thinks his love is hopeless, and that's why he's, he looked so... Her mind went swiftly back to those times when she had caught him looking at her in, this, in, a, in that strange manner, when the grey eyes that were such perfect curtains for his thoughts and had been wide and, na and naked and had in them a look of torment and despair. He's broken hearted because he thinks I'm in love with Brent or Stuart or Kate. And probably he thinks that if he can't have me, he might as well please his family and marry Melanie. But if he knew I did love him, her volatile, her volatile spirit shot up from deepest depression to excited happiness. This was the answer to Ashley's reticence, to his strange conduct. He didn't know. Her vanity leaped to the aid of her desire to believe, making belief a certainty. If he knew she loved him, he would hasten to her side. She had only to... Oh, she thought rapturously, digging her fingers into her lowered brow. What a fool I've been not to think of this till now. I must think of some way to, to let him know. He couldn't marry her if he, if he knew I loved him. How could he? With a start she realised that Gerald had finished and her mother's eyes were on her. Hastily she began her de decade telling off the beads automatically but with a depth of emotion in her voice that caused Mammy to open her eyes and shoot her a searching glance at her. As she finished her prayers and Sue Ellen then Karine began their decades. Her mind was still speeding onward with her enchanting, entrancing new thought. Even now it wasn't too late. Too often the county had been scandalised by elopements when one or the other of the part, participating part, partners was practically at the altar with a third. And Ashley's engagement had not yet even been announced yet. Yes, there was plenty of time. 
if no one lay between Ashley and Melanie, but only a promise given long ago, then why wasn't it possible for him to break that promise and marry her? Surely he would do it if he knew that she, Scarlet, loved him. She must find some way to let him know. She would find some way and then. Scarlet came abruptly out of a dream of delight for she had neglected to make the responses and her mother was looking at her reprovingly. As she resumed the ritual, she opened her eyes briefly and cast a quick glance around the room. The kneeling figures, the soft glow of the lamp, the dim shadows where the, where the black swayed, even the family objects that had been so hateful to her sight an hour ago, in an instant looked took on the colour of her own emotions and the room seemed once more a lovely place. She would never forget this moment or this scene. Virgin most faithful, her mother intoned. The litany of the Virgin was beginning and obediently Scarlet responded, pray for us. As Ellen praised in soft contralto the attributes of the Mother of God, as always since childhood, this was for Scarlet, a moment for ad adoration of Ellen, rather than the Virgin. Sacrilegious though it might be, Scarlet always saw through her closed eyes the upturned face of Ellen and not the Blessed Virgin. As the ancient phrases were repeated, health of the sick, seat of wisdom, refuge of sinners, mystical rose, they were beautiful because they were the attributes of Ellen, but tonight, because of the exhalation of her own spirit, Scarlet found the whole ceremony, the softly spoken words, the murmur of responses, a surpassing beauty beyond any that she had ever experienced before. And her heart went up to God in sincere thankfulness that a pathway for her feet had been opened. Out of her misery and straight to the arms of Ashley. When the last amen sounded, they all rose somewhat stiffly, Mammy being hauled to her feet by the combined efforts of Tina and Rosa. Pork took a long spiller from the mantelpiece, lit it from the lamp flame and went into the hall. Opposite the winding stair stood a walnut sideboard, too large for the use in the dining room, bearing on its wide top several lamps and a long row of candles in candlesticks. Pork lit one lamp and three candles, and with the pompous dignity of the first chamberlain of the royal bedchamber, lighting a, lighting a king and queen to their rooms, he led the procession up the stairs, holding the light high above his head. Helen, sorry, Ellen on Gerald's arm, followed him, and the girls, each talking, her, each taking her own candlestick, mounted after them. Scarlet entered her room, set the candle on the tall chest of drawers, and fumbled in the dark closet for the dancing dress that needed stitching, throwing it across her arm. She crossed to the hall quietly. The door of her parents' bedroom was slightly ajar, and before she could knock, Ellen's voice, low but stern, came to her ears. Mr. O'Hara, you must dismiss Jonas Wilkerson. Gerald exploded, and where will I, get, where will I be getting another overseer who wouldn't be cheating me out of my eye teeth? He must be dismissed immediately, tomorrow morning. Big Sam is a good foreman and he can take over the duties until you can hire another overseer. Uh-huh, came Gerald's voice. So I understand then that the worthy Jonas sighed the, he must be dismissed. So he is the fa father of Emmy Slattery's baby, thought Scarlet. Oh well, what else can you expect from a Yankee man? and a white trash girl. Then after a discreet pause, which gave Gerald spluttering time to die away, 
She knocked on the door and handed the dress to her mother. By the time Scarlett had undressed and blown out the candle, her plan for tomorrow had worked itself out in every detail. It was a simple plan, for with Gerald's single-mindedness of purpose, her eyes were centred on the goal, and she thought only of the most direct steps by which to reach it. First she would be prideful as Gerald had commanded. From the moment she arrived at Twelve Oaks she would be at her gayest, most spirited self. No one would, su would suspect that she had ever been downhearted because of Ashley and Melanie. And she would flirt with every man there. That would be cruel to Ashley, but it would make him yearn for her all the more. She wouldn't overlook a, a man of marriageable age from ginger-whiskered old Frank Kennedy, who was Sue Ellen's beau, on down to shy, quiet, blushing Charles Hamilton, Melanie's brother. They would swarm around her like bees around a hive, and certainly Ashley would be drawn, would be drawn from Melody, Melanie to join the circle of her admirers, when somehow she would manoeuvre to get a few minutes alone with him, away from the crowd. She hoped everything would work out that way, because it would be more difficult otherwise. But if Ashley didn't make, her, make the first move, she would simply have to do it herself. When they were finally alone, he would have fresh in his mind the picture of the other men thronging about her. He would be newly impressed with the fact that every one of them wanted her and that look of sadness and despair would be in his eyes. Then she would make him happy again by letting him discover that, popular though she was, she preferred him above any other man in all the world. And when she admitted it modestly and sweetly, she would look a thousand things more. Of course she would do it in a ladylike way. She wouldn't even dream of saying to him boldly that she loved him. That would never do. But the manner of telling him was a detail that troubled her not at all. She had managed such situations before and she could do it again. Lying in the bed with the moonlight stri streaming dimly over her, she pictured the whole scene in her mind. She saw the look of surprise and happiness that would come over his face when he realised that she really loved him and she heard the words he would ask, he would say, asking her to be his wife. Naturally she would have to say, them, say then that she simply couldn't think of marrying a man when, she, when he was engaged to another girl. But he would insist and finally she would let herself be persuaded. Then they would decide to run off to Jonesboro that very afternoon and why by this time tomorrow night she might be Mrs Ashley Wilkes. She sat up in bed hugging her knees and for a long happy moment she was Mrs Ash Ashley Wilkes. Ashley's bride. Then a slight chill entered her heart. Suppose it didn't work out this way. Suppose Ashley didn't beg her to run away with him. Resolutely, she pushed the thought from her mind. I won't think of that now, she said firmly. If I think of it now, it will upset me. There's no reason why things won't come out the way I want them. If he loves me, and I know he does. She raised her chin and her pale black fringed eyes sparkled in the moonlight. Ellen had never told her that desire and attainment were two different matters. Life had not taught her that the race was not to the swift. She lay in the silvery shadows with courage ri rising 
and made the plans that a 16 year old makes when life has been so pleasant and defeat is impossible is an impossibility and pre and a pretty dress a clear complexion are weapons to vanquish fate I think that's enough because we're just now going into chapter 5 and we can cha start chapter 5 next time. Um, again, it's been great being here with you. Um, I'm really enjoying this diamond painting. Um, my fingers are really giving me trouble. They're going numb quite quickly so um, I'm actually painting slower and slower, but I'm still getting there. Um, hopefully one day the numbness will go, but I think that's just dreaming. Anyway, I hope you have a good time, and I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye for now.